Hi, Jeff. Oh, I see you came prepared for our cozy little video call today. Hi. Yes, Melina. Uh, as you instructed, I have a candle. You're good at following instructions. I try to try to accommodate <laughs> when I can. Fantastic. But my candle's lit now. Guess we can start with my little experiment then. Okay. What I want you to do is blow out the candle, mm -hmm. then light your matches and mm -hmm. bring the flame close to the smoke. Okay. That sounds doable. Yeah. I'm going to try. From know-how to wow, the Bosch Global Podcast. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. So, like you said, uh, I, I lit that match, and as soon as as soon as I blew out the candle, and then it yeah was probably three centimeters away from the actual uh, candlestick, and it it still reignited. That was kind of wild. Uh huh. I didn't expect it to be that easy. It went right down. That was nuts. And and that's the end <laughs> of <laughs> okay. the experiment. What is it that we've learned? Smoke is flammable, right? You set the smoke on fire, which then ignited the candle. That's that's crazy. I really didn't expect that to be <laughs> that that quick. It just it just rushed right down. Ta -da. I had heard that you could do that, but I'd never actually seen it. Fantastic, because wow. with this little bit of knowledge, we are even more prepared for today's episode. Welcome everyone to episode 13. It will be a fiery one. Oh, come on. Aren't we always burning it up, Milena? <laughs> well, yeah, no doubt about that. But this time I'd say even more so. We will explore how cameras can detect fires visually. There's some pretty cool AI at play. And we'll talk to the smart people behind it, like Bosch associate Søren Wittmann. Aviotech is a camera that can detect flames and smoke in, in the image. And because it is a video-based uh, detection, it can um, detect fires at their source. And I'm very excited to show you a very special place that Bosch has, which I had no idea even existed, our very own fire lab. But first, let's understand the phenomenon of fire a little better. And really, I think we found the best person in the world to talk about this. And that's this guy. Well, my name is Shan Rafael. I've been a professional firefighter in Brisbane, Australia here for the last 38 years. Shane is not only a firefighter, he is also a language teacher. <laughs> I knew it. I always knew Australian was its own language. <laughs> Boy! <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, I just heard the funniest Australian expression a couple of days ago, which was flat out like lizard drinking, which means that you're, <laughs> that you're super busy. It, it is its own language, right? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> uh, but, but, but no, Jeff. <laughs> he teaches how to read fires. Reading the fire is like understanding a new language. If someone's talking to you in a foreign language, they're telling you something. It may mean nothing to you. But if I understand that language, if I learn the language of fire, for example, these little subtle indicators that I see in smoke and heat and air and flame start to mean something to me. So basically it's literacy. I'm, I'm teaching these guys a language, a language of fire behavior. He teaches firefighters around the world to better understand fire. Okay, so what, what is it then that we can learn from him? Give me, give me my first lesson. Mm, well, what is in the, the dictionary of fire behavior? You've already had your first lesson. We don't think of smoke as something that's just toxic. We think of smoke as unburnt fuel. Right, so smoke is flammable. So then in that case, it's dangerous for firefighters even as they're wearing their oxygen masks. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Shane says there are situations where smoke can really be explosive, especially when it mixes with oxygen. Fire gas ignition. So this is a situation where the smoke from the original fire is traveling through the building, down corridors, through roof spaces, through hidden wall spaces or whatever. And it, it congregates at some distance from the fire and it pre-mixes. So the smoke's not so hot, it's cooled down. But in reality, it's still laden with fuel. And in some ways, it's worse because it's pre-mixed. So if we get that original fire extending out of the space that it's been confined into, 
into this area where the smoke has accumulated, we can get an extremely powerful event. And the indicators are very subtle and the results are extremely powerful. They can literally uh, be like an explosion and lift roofs up and blow walls down. This sounds like one of those things that you would you would see in a movie and you think it might just be Hollywood. And action. But it is a real life threat. Yeah. And that's just one of multiple scenarios where a sudden event like that can happen. For the experts among us, the other two are called backdraft and flashover. And just from the sound of them, they must be pretty bad as well. Right. I mean, certainly that, that 90s movie left an impression on me. You definitely don't want to be surprised by them. But that regularly happened and still happens to firefighters, unfortunately. In 1993, we had two guys killed in an unexpected event. There was a, there was a two or three a severe, unexplained fire phenomenon events that dislodged these guys from the hose line and gave them burns severe enough to render them unconscious. We lost two of our best and we didn't have the answers. And I thought, this can't be. It's the 20th century. We must have the answers. Shane says this changed his career. And so began his search. He heard that firefighters in some other countries had a better understanding of some of the phenomena, especially in Sweden and the UK. It took some convincing and Shane was able to show that an experience exchange could save the lives of many firefighters. He spent one year learning from his Swedish colleagues. So did they then have the answers he was looking for? Some of them, yes. Shane says he learned from firefighters in 26 countries. And all that knowledge he put into one simple formula. Be safe. Be safe as a mnemonic, like an acronym? Yeah, he spells it a little differently. B-E-S-A-H-F. Mm -hmm. The letters stand for the indicators that firefighters should pay attention to when they want to understand a fire. B for building. E for environment. S for smoke. A for air. H for heat. And F for flame. Building, environment, smoke, air, heat, and flame. Be safe. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that that flame comes last. That's usually the first thing you think about in the context of a fire. Flame is last because often firefighters, well, like everybody else, if we see flame, we can get fixated on it. And uh, when we see flame, that's easy. So I say to the guys, that's good. You know where that flame is, but look over here. Look at the smoke. What's it telling you? Where is the fire going to go next? So don't get fixated on that flame. Go back to that smoke and air and all the other indicators and refocus on the, the whole picture. So smoke. We just learned that smoke itself is flammable. But when I look at a fire... What can the smoke itself tell me? The single biggest indicator is the smoke. So the, the, the sub-indicators we look for are the color of the smoke, the buoyancy of the smoke. Is it, is it rising up aggressively? Is it expanding as it comes out? Uh, and the height of the smoke layer, is it down very low or is it up very high? Maybe we can look at one of those indicators in a little more detail. It's a complex topic and there is a lot to learn about smoke. Focusing on the color of smoke alone is already pretty expensive. And there's a lot of myths out there about the color of smoke. For example, white smoke. This You look at it and, and something in your DNA says, oh, it's white, it's not very hot, it can't be very dangerous. And the reality is it's extremely dangerous. We actually have less unburnt fuel in the grey smoke and the darker smoke than we do in the white smoke. It is the most fuel-laden smoke there is. And unfortunately, this is one of the most poorly understood topics in the fire service. Mm -hmm. Every time I teach it, people are going, huh, wow, I didn't realise that. Are you sure? And I have to show them videos uh, and experiments to prove it to them. And this is a real gap mm -hmm. in firefighters' knowledge. Did you notice he snuck a wow in there already? Wow. <laughs> yeah, and, uh -huh. that's what I thought while he was talking, yeah. So, yeah, Shane has been filling those knowledge gaps for 20-some years now. Be safe. He's written books about it, he gives webinars, and now he trains trainers to pass on the knowledge to more people and keep it spreading once he retires in a few years. He started his research and he came up with Be Safe because he lost colleagues in devastating fires. 
So I guess by helping them understand fires, or read fires, as he said, he must have saved a lot of lives. I'm sure that's the case, yeah. He says it's impossible to know, but the feedback he gets goes into that same direction. I don't know how many times have had guys ring me up and say, hey, you know, uh, a week after you did that training, we had this situation, you know, I saw backdraft indicators, I called everybody out, and they're all going, huh? What are you doing? They didn't see it, he saw it, and then there was an event that, that could have been fatal for those guys. And I get a lot of that sort of feedback saying, we had this close call, I remembered what you said, and we applied it, and you know, we, we got out of there. So that's really, really rewarding to think that I've been able to do that. Thank you so much, Shane. And thank you to all the other firefighting women and men in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much. Jeff, did you ever have an emergency where firefighters helped you? Uh, I'm, I'm actually lucky enough to uh, have never needed emergency fire services. Uh, but I did have the opportunity to volunteer with my local fire department in high school. Oh, really? I got to spend time with them in the firehouse and learned all about their equipment and their training and their practices. It, it was really impressive, to be honest. Really cool. Uh, what about you, Melina? Um, well, in fact, uh, last week a friend told me about a fire that broke out in the ground floor apartment of her building. Oh, no. In the middle of the night. And um, she woke up because she uh, had the impression of some... Some, some weird chemical smell. Oh, that's and, frightening. Yeah, she, she checked on that, and apparently one of the electronic devices had a short circuit, which caused the fire. Whew. So, I don't know, just, just listening to her was super scary. I mean, fortunately, she, she's discovered it in time, and the damage wasn't too bad, but... Oh, that's so lucky. Oh, it's pretty scary. Yeah. Yeah. Our Australian friend Shane Raffle looks at fires with expert eyes. In a lab at Bosch, engineers develop another expert eye for reading the language of fires. A smart camera that works as a smoke and fire detector. Søren Wittmann is the project manager and the product is called Aviotech. Aviotech is developed for areas or applications where normal, I call it standard or classic fire detectors, have problems to detect flames or smoke. Huh. Why is that? A smoke detector is mounted at the ceiling. The smoke has to come from the fire source to the detector. And this might take minutes. Mm -hmm. And if you think about industrial applications where you have ceiling heights of sometimes 20 meters, if you can detect within seconds then this is, is a benefit also for the customer because the fire is detected very early when the fire is very small. So the damage is lower, it's easier to extinguish, and these are the benefits. Okay, that, that makes sense. Smoke can take minutes to reach the ceiling, though. Oh, yeah. Soren says it could take quite a long time. He's even seen cases where the smoke doesn't actually rise to the ceiling at all. It creates a layer within the building like uh, low-hanging clouds or even a fog. How is that possible? Well, it depends on how the building is heated or air-conditioned, whether it's insulated or not. You could have a hot layer of air under the ceiling that's actually hotter than the smoke of a fire that had, that had just started, and so then the smoke lingers underneath that hot air under the ceiling. Okay, but for Aviotech, that doesn't matter then? No, it doesn't matter because it's a visual system. If you can see a flame or smoke... Aviatech can see it as well. We have two parts in, in the algorithm. One part is the flame detection, and the other part is the smoke detection. The flame detection is, is searching, for example, for flickering areas in the image and for areas which are flame-colored, which may be white, yellow, red, orange. That sounds easy enough. To be honest, it is really straightforward to detect flame in an image, but to distinguish it later on from disturbances, this is the real part which makes it complex. Mm, okay, so it's easy to find areas in an image that could be a flame, but to be sure that it's a flame, then it gets tricky. That's right. It takes the system as little as two seconds to detect a flame itself. But then several AI-supported verification algorithms kick in to make sure that it's really not something else. 
That something else could be a moving person or a flashing light or a million other things. Soren talks about the test installation that they had in the early days of Aviatech. It was a garbage plant somewhere, and there were diggers. And they are moving around, and they are turning, and at these diggers, they are blinking lights. So now these rotating beacons, these blinking lights, we also had a blinking light analysis. So to say, okay, if it is a yellow blinking light, we say, okay, the frequency, it's too stable. It's not a flame because a flame has different frequencies. It's not one dominant frequency you, you will see there. And to be clear, this is about the frequency of the blinking, or respectively, if it were a flame, the flickering. And in this case, we were sure that these rotating beacons will not cause nuisance alarms in, in our camera. But then these rotating beacons are rotating, and the digger below is also rotating. So we have an overlap of two rotations, and this leads to a change of the frequency, and we got nuisance alarms again. And there was a lot of effort in how to deal with this and how to design the frequency analysis that we can also throw out these rotating beacons on rotating platforms like diggers, etc. So this was really complex. Oh, I bet. Always great when reality plays a trick on you. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, a great example for all the things that can happen when you want to bring a product from development in the lab to the market and to finally practical applications. Mm -hmm. I would say that's another wow. Wow. They solved it successfully and Aviotech detects flames reliably. So what about smoke though? Does it read smoke like our Australian guest Shane Raffle? It's a good question. Not all fires have visible flames. Or maybe the flame is out of the field of vision for the Aviotech camera. And this is where existing Bosch know-how helped the Aviotech team a lot. They benefited from developments in the self-driving car area. Oh, Our smoke detection is based on an algorithm of Bosch, which is developed for autonomous driving. So it is motion estimation algorithm, which is analyzing the image. Um, so which region is moving, <laughs> how fast, in which direction. And this we are using for the detection of this uprising effect of the smoke. Ha, huh. yes. It's a bit unexpected, isn't it? <laughs> That's is quite the interesting connection. Yeah, I didn't expect that. <laughs> unexpected and genius, I'd say. For me, this is already the third wow moment on this episode. Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, so... Counting the wows here. Wow. <laughs> so back to the camera. An uprising motion gets detected, and the algorithm checks that this is a continuous movement without much acceleration. They could even use that autonomous car algorithm without a need to adapt it to this very different use case, even though cars are moving and Aviatech uses only stationary cameras. But to be certain that it is smoke, more algorithms are needed, which look for even more features. And these each have been coded specifically for the Aviatech use case. And then we add additional algorithms on that, checking the color of the object. Is it colored or is it not colored? Smoke is normally white, gray, black, something like this. As we also learned from firefighter Shane earlier on the show. If we have a fire that's burning well, we get less smoke and therefore we get less carbon and it, it's a gray color. If we hinder the fire development, it starts to get darker and darker and darker and down to the point where the smoke can be almost black. And of course, light smoke is somewhat transparent. It just blurs the background. And that's something Aviotech's algorithms can detect as well. On the other hand side, is it turbulent? So it's, it's not a gray area in the image, but it is somewhere structured. But it has no sharp edges. So if you have very sharp edges, uh, contrast edges, these are normally objects in, in an image. So all these algorithms come together and were added to, to one alarm decision at the end. Mm -hmm. So in the end, the algorithms decide, is this a fire or not? So talking about artificial intelligence here? Correct. The algorithms give input to an AI system which decides if it is a fire or not. Mm -hmm. Thanks to this AI, the system can also operate at super low light conditions, even down to two lux for those illuminance nerds out there. And for the uh, non-nerds, 
<laughs> how, how dark is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that that would that would be uh, two lumens spread across one square meter, which you can roughly equate to the brightness of moonlight. Got it. So <laughs> pretty dark. Pretty yeah. dark. Pretty dark. <laughs> but even in complete darkness, wouldn't be too dark for Aviatech, and that is some more magic. All it needs is some infrared light. Wait, I've seen images from infrared cameras, and they are black and white. Yes, that's right. The color of the flames or the smoke are not the important component for the AI. It can work with black and white images. And the journey continues. Aviatech is becoming even more intelligent now. Soren and his team have started to introduce deep learning to Aviatech. So sometime in the future, sometime soon, probably, the current algorithms will actually be replaced by an AI model of smoke and flames. Oh, can you give me a little sneak peek of the development? Absolutely. Please uh, do. For that exactly, here's Søren's colleague, Carolyn Hartel, who also works on the Aviotech AI. She has a PhD in physics and joined the team as a developer in 2019. So we're using deep learning because we know that, uh, in principle, it can be much faster and much more reliable from our tests on the same data. And we're bringing it to the camera. The current approach can initially detect a fire within two seconds, which, honestly, that's amazing. But additional time is still needed to verify that it actually is a fire. The lowest verification time you can use is like 10 seconds. So um, it's, it also sees that there is a fire, but as it's not that sure, it takes longer to verify that this is really a fire. And the deep learning system can be very fast. It can do it with only a few frames, only a very, very short sequence. So that means flame or smoke in the camera image for just a few frames is enough to trigger the alarm. Oh, that's cool. And Carolyn says it's much more versatile and actually has fewer constraints. So when there are hand-tuned features, the person who designs the feature always has a certain scenario in mind and says, okay, fire always behaves like this or that. And according to this, there's a certain limit that will not be surpassed. But then the person did not have in mind as another scenario where there was maybe a lot of wind. So this is then excluded. And deep learning, it can see a lot of data. So it extracts the features from a lot more different scenarios. Oh, that's right. You need to show the neural network some examples of fires. Well, mm -hmm. a, a lot of examples, actually. <laughs> yes. In different conditions and contexts. And it comes up with the detection algorithm on its own. Simply put. <laughs> yes, simply put. Right. Uh, and by doing that, Aviatech can cover more potential installations. Until recently, it only worked indoors. Now, with the latest update, it can also be used in partially enclosed outdoor spaces, like a parking garage. And with deep learning, Carolyn is aiming at making Aviatech suitable for any outdoor space. Mm, how does an outdoor fire differ from an indoor fire? In outdoor scenarios where you have strong winds or very bright illumination or illumination changes or in tunnels. That's a really challenging environment. And for those scenarios, the detection of the deep learning can be much, much better. Carolyn has tried various neural network architectures and picked the best ones suited for this particular task. That makes sense, yeah. Now the team is working on feeding it the right data. We are improving the database because everything in the um, neural network is about the data. So the, the data needs to be a good representation of reality. Otherwise, the algorithm will learn something it shouldn't learn. <laughs> so it's important to use very carefully designed metrics to measure your, the performance of your algorithm and to use carefully selected data for the training as well as for the evaluation of the performance of the algorithm. So where do you get videos of fires? It turns out it's not quite as simple as just watching YouTube. The fires don't always look like YouTube videos. <laughs> it's not like always an explosion <laughs> and someone walking away with sunglasses from the fire, not caring about it in the background. Hasta la vista, baby. 
<laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. Spanish with a German <laughs> accent. It's fantastic. It's just like the movie. <laughs> but rather than from movie scenes, they get some of the fire data from home videos. Soren likes to make fires in his back and front yard. <laughs> Wait. My backyard is now in the validation and test set, and my front yard is in the training set. So, as you know, it is not good to use the same view in the trainings and in the test or validation set. So, therefore, I separated it also here. His definition of home office, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm a little bit, uh, there's a little pyromaniac inside oh, of me. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> I also like testing our cameras. And if they work. Yeah, these are small fires. So, for example, smoldering wood fires. Sometimes I used smoke cartridges. You could do liquid fires with petroleum or kerosene, which you could easily extinguish afterwards so that there's no risk for my uh, property and also not for my neighbors. <laughs> Yeah, fingers yeah. crossed. <laughs> I, imagine, I imagine you and the neighbors have, have at least a little bit of fun with that. Uh, yes. And once a year, my neighbors got a barbecue because they are now used to all the smoke <laughs> and all the fires I'm doing here each year. <laughs> it really sounds like he made the best out of working from home. Yes. <laughs> but I'm sure to prove that the system is really working, they can just have it detect some backyard fires. The backyard fires help to add scenarios where smoke might move, you know, horizontally because of the wind or the flame flickers in an unusual pattern because of environmental factors that you just wouldn't see indoors. So that's great for development and testing. But for certification, well, certification is actually a tricky topic since the technology is very new. And that means that there's no international standard yet. But it could set a new standard in the future. Already, German VDS and the Australian CSIRO have certified Aviatech for indoor use with their independent quality marks. VDS. Vertrauen durch Sicherheit. Oh. Trust through safety. I just wanted to say that in German. Can you say it one more time? It sounds so good. Vertrauen durch Sicherheit. Yes. <laughs> So it's, it's testing products, certifying products, services, and also companies according to standards. And therefore, Aviotech was the first video-based fire detection which got this VDS mark on it. What is standardized and very well defined, though, is how you test a fire detector. You push the button and uh, check if it beeps. <laughs> yep. <Duh. laughs> Ganz genau. Uh, no, uh, Søren and Carolyn do this in the fire lab. A very special room at Bosch, actually. Imagine a very empty, naked if you will, uh, white tiled room. Almost like an empty swimming pool. Fire labs are defined also in, in the European standards. So our fire lab is 10 meters long, 6 meters wide and 4 meters high. And the fireplace is directly in the middle of this room. And now the norms define where to mount the detectors and you have other, other requirements. For example, that the maximum temperature difference of the wall in this room is 0 0.5 Kelvin. So, which means you have to heat and to cool each side of the room. So um, there's cooling and heating in each wall, in the ceiling and the floor to keep this requirement. And why you're doing this effort is that the smoke behaves like the smoke shall behave. Because if there's a cool spot in this uh, room, the smoke will turn into this direction. And this would affect the measurements of the smoke density, which will be done below the ceiling. And this smoke density is the measurement when a detector should trigger an alarm. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, and I never thought I would, I would say this sentence, but the fires themselves have to follow the standards. <laughs> So wait, in the beginning we talked about how uncontrollable fire can be. And now Sören makes standard fires? What, what does a standard fire look like? He says there are eight test fires, ranging from burning wood bricks to smoldering wood on something like a cooking plate to burning cotton or plastic. Now, this is all nice, and it's great that Aviatech can detect flames and smoke at least as well as other fire detectors. Mm, I'd hope so. But does that convince our customers? Yes. <laughs> well, of course. It turns out they just need to see it with their own eyes. 
The best way to convince customers is to do fire tests on their premises. So normally in 80 to 90 percent of all these fire tests you're doing, you will sell it later on uh, because they are impressed how fast it is reacting. We had tests we did where customers set their own fire panel to in walk test mode so that it's not triggering a real alarm to the fire department, but it will be shown on the panel and the camera detected, but their system didn't detect anything because the flame and the smoke was too small to be detected by their detectors. And they were really impressed how fast and how good it is working in their applications. And I'd ask you to bring a candle. Why didn't we do a <laughs> test fire in my backyard? Because <laughs> seeing is believing, right? <laughs> and you know who was skeptical at first too? Our Australian firefighter, Shane Raffle. But what we found was that uh, the first couple of fires that we had, the early warning came from the cameras. So it gives really a big head start. Aviotech has been installed in one of the longest road tunnels in Australia. Right. Uh, we haven't really talked about where Aviotech is used. Mm -hmm. Tunnels are certainly one application. What else aside from Sören's backyard? Uh, actually, in the pulp and paper industry with high ceilings and lots and lots of things that can catch fire easily, Aviatech has already proven its worth. Also, other production facilities, like in the fertilizer industry, for instance. Mm -hmm. Airplane hangars, train stations, outdoor storage areas. And here's another interesting advantage that Aviatech has. Since it's a smart camera, it can also detect other things. Means in the tunnels, for example, it can detect when something unusual happens people on the road or an animal in the tunnel, for example. Yes, and in those cases, it can trigger an alarm as well. And there's another use case that Soren talked about, train stations, where the camera can detect when someone falls onto the tracks. Or in an industrial setting, it could alert someone if an emergency exit gets blocked. There are a lot of things you could monitor with it, besides flames and smoke. That is great. <laughs> Firefighters like Shane can also imagine Aviotag as a webcam. If we could get vision, if we could tap into cameras, for example, inside a building and actually get vision inside of there, en route to the fire, I mean, that would give us an enormous advantage. The first contact point of the fire department is the guard at the main gate. And what could be done is that a tablet is stored there, which gives you the live insights of the camera. We could know, yes, that is well involved. Look, it's over here. Look at the color of the smoke. So we, we get intelligence on route. So the, the fire department goes there, grabbing the tablet, grabbing all the information uh, which is needed to find the fire on this premises, and they could have an insight what is happening there. So they could do it while they're driving to, to the building. A tablet that the firefighters can look at on route to the fire. I think we've established that Aviotech is great technology. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know me. I self-describe as a Bosch fanboy. <laughs> and and this is this is a fanboy moment. I mean, this technology is truly, I mean, it, it's literally saving lives. Yeah. So this is my, my personal wow moment. Yep, that is definitely invented for life. Yeah. It shows what is possible when you make technology smart. We started by solving the problem of fire detection in tall manufacturing or storage facilities. And then all these other benefits emerged. One little caveat, though. I think we should make it clear that Aviatech remains a solution for commercial spaces. It's, it's not going to be available for consumers to install in their homes. Yes, so we should rely on traditional smoke detectors. Yes. Shen reminds us to check the batteries regularly. And to test them at least once a month. Just get the other broom handle and push that little button and make sure they're working. I should probably do that. Make sure it beeps. Yeah, right. Yep. <laughs> and since I know our audience is interested in smart technology... Oh, come on, who isn't? There are also smarter detectors available. Photo-optical detectors. Well, I can replace my detectors, my ionization detectors, with photo-optical. And I can interconnect them wirelessly. So it, it sets up a, like a little ad hoc network. But I must use the type of detector that has a 10-year sealed battery. So these are a special battery. There's no servicing required. They've got a 10-year lifespan, and then you throw them away and put a new one up there. So these detectors are connected to one another, which means if the detector in your kitchen goes off at night, the one in your bedroom will too and wake you up. 
That's great. Which would have been a great help for the friend of mine I mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And and that's really great. That's really peace of mind technology, which is what a lot of us are after, I think. And it's really important to get that message out. So thank you for that, Melina. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wrap. Thank you, Jeff. But before we go, to our dear listeners, please don't forget to check out our show notes for more information about Aviatech and how to read a fire. See you next time when we'll talk about a topic that is very personal to me, Bosch technology helping mothers and babies. I can't wait. <laughs> See you then, Melina. <laughs> See you then. Bye, Jeff. Bye. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. I'm on fire. Hasta la vista. Yeah. Hasta I had to watch vista. that again on YouTube. <laughs> I was I was cracking up as I was reading the script. Hasta la vista.